Before we begin the main topic for today's episode, I'm curious, Jason, if you've ever heard of something called ghost pipe. Those words together (laughs) mean nothing to me. Well, ghost pipe, according to a friend of mine who is someone who spends a lot of time looking for, I guess, holistic alternatives to traditional or pharmaceutical medicine. She and I have been talking about um, neurodivergent people and factors like anxiety, which I have been speaking about recently and I know a number of our listeners struggle with something in in those uh, categories. Uh, She sent me information on ghost pipe, which is a little known nervine, if I'm pronouncing nervine right, N-E-R-V-I-N-E. And she was telling me about its ability to support people with anxiety and even PTSD. I'm going to link to the sources that she sent me in our show notes at wellevator.com, which if you have not visited our website, it's spelled W-E-L-L-E-V-A-T-R.com. If you go to the podcast section, podcast.wellevator.com to be exact, there is a, a transcript and a list of resources, including this. So it actually has a different name, which I will attempt the scientific name. The pronunciation is Along the well, I guess this isn't so hard now that I'm looking at it. Monotropa uniflora. It originates from Asia, but also certain parts of North America and South America. And it is an herbaceous perennial plant that scanning this in real time, it has all these different names. Um that uh thought it was going to be like right at the beginning, the description. Nope. It's not. Nope. Not that easy. <laughs> Got to look this, at all the ads on the webpage. They, it wouldn't make it that, that easy. No, it, it's, make- like a, it's like a very scientific description. And I was looking for like a one liner that would <laughs> help me describe it. Um, but long story short, as I mentioned, it is a way to support yourself through a lot of different mental and physical challenges. Apparently, it also can help with physical pain. But my friend recommended that I look into it for emotional pain. Um, And so there's this whole article on it. It gets into the detail. I feel like you would geek out over it, Jason. Um, And I believe a practitioner wrote one of these documents and they said that they were using it for physical pain, migraine-like headaches associated with traumatic brain injury, anxiety and panic associated with emotional or sensory overload, which is what I tend to struggle with, triggering of emotional memories that may make someone feel beside herself, and unpleasant, intense, mind-altering experiences, especially with tryptamine bearing plants, fungi, and drugs. Um, It also looks like back in the late 1800s, it was used for periodic fevers, childhood seizures, epileptic seizures, inflammation. And it's super fascinating. But then my friend said, it's a little challenging to find because I got excited about it. And then she was like, well, the downside is that it's not readily available. Although I feel like now that I know about it, I can keep my eyes and ears open for it and learn more about it and see if it's something that I can take. People will turn it into teas, tinctures, that sort of thing. And one benefit of living on the West Coast of the United States is that There's a lot of people that are into herbal remedies, and I wouldn't be surprised if if one of our friends knows about this, Jason. So I'm curious, is this sparking your curiosity, and where would you go to learn more about this and to potentially track some down to try? Well, tracking some down to try looks pretty easy because it looks like there are herbalists on Etsy who are 
making this into a liquid tincture. So there is someone right here who looks like an herbalist who has a monotropa uniflora tincture. Really cool. We'll put this in the show notes at wellevator.com, W-E-L-L-E-V-A-T-R.com. And it looks like this person is bottling and creating their own concentrated tinctures out of this ghost pipe. Again, monotropa uniflora. So you can find it on Etsy. It looks like it looks like there's actually a lot, Whitney. Uh, when they bring up the suggested similar items, there's like 10, 8 to 10 people, it looks like, creating ghost pipe tinctures. So who knew? Apparently, Etsy is a great place to go. There are a couple of friends that I will go to to ask about this immediately that I can think of. Um, one is our dear friend, Jay Denman who was an herbalist and worked at the Air Juan Tonic Bar for years in LA. Uh, he and his partner, Joy, have an incredibly deep knowledge, an encyclopedic knowledge almost, of these type of herbs. So I think I'm going to text Jay after this episode to get his opinion on it. The other person is um, is our friend Pamela, who is uh, Adam Yasmin's partner. He was a previous guest. She has an incredible knowledge of herbalism as well. So I'm going to run it by those two friends and see what they think. But apparently it's pretty easy to obtain on Etsy. Um, this one in particular looks really reputable. Um, this person has five-star reviews, over 1,200 five-star reviews, 2,700 sales, and they're selling a $40 ghost pipe monotropa uniflora tincture. I kind of want to try it. I mean, you, you definitely piqued my interest, Whitney, when you talked about anxiety. On a side note, I have noticed now that I have been microdosing psilocybin mushroom for, I think I'm going on a month now, I have noticed that my daily anxiety has decreased at least 50%. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't have my moments, but I've noticed a profound difference with microdosing five days on, two days off with psilocybin mushroom over the course of one month. So Which that's is been something that you were prescribed basically by your doctor and therapist. That is correct. Yeah. Which so, is an important thing to mention because, you know, as much as we advocate for alternatives to um, pharmaceuticals, We also think it's incredibly important to consult a doctor or some type of medical practitioner before engaging in the. And I think this is important um, a disclosure to give that neither of us are are licensed or uh, able. So when we talk about something like ghost pipe, we're just you know exploring it. But if you're going to try something like this, just a reminder: it's important to make sure that you're checking your sources and also speaking to someone who is able to give you medical advice based on your specific needs. Yeah, and this is incredibly important because when even when we're talking about natural slash holistic slash herbal remedies, regulating one's dosage and having it be monitored with a professional is really really important, especially if any of these substances have any sort of psychotropic effects or mind altering effects, right? So I've never had ghost pipe. I have no idea what it would do to my body, but I would want to let my practitioners know. I have two amazing people. I have a functional medicine doctor here in Los Angeles, Dr. Alan Green. I have my therapist, uh, Gary Glickman, and they you know, they both actually called and talked to each other, which was to me a beautiful thing when it was like, okay, I've been having severe depression. I've been having a lot of suicidal thoughts, like really in a lot of despair. And to have the two of them talk about what the proper game plan was, to me, that was a huge blessing to have my therapist and my functional medicine doctor talk. To back up what you said, Whitney, I think it is important. Some people have an attitude, you know, of like, fuck it, I know best. I'm just going to experiment with my own body. That's okay if that's your choice, but as a cautionary measure, uh, I have a family member who has also had some struggles with mental health over the years, as I have, different different ways of struggling with mental health, but um, they were on uh, lithium, and lithium orotate is a natural mineral. Obviously, it's synthesized. I didn't know this. She was having some issues with her lithium dosage, and I didn't know this, Whitney, but apparently in some cases, 
if you're on too high of a dosage of lithium for mental health, it can not only uh, negatively affect your kidney function, but it can actually in high enough doses cause hearing loss, right? I did not know this. So, you know, my family's very open about, you know, our health struggles, not just my mental health struggles, but we're, we're, we're a really open family. But my point is this, um, I started taking lithium about two years ago off the shelf. I just grabbed it and started taking it. But when I learned about the potential for hearing loss and kidney malfunction by overdoing it, I was not doing my lithium under the guidance of my doctor, um, or my therapist. I was just like, I'm going to grab it off the shelf and try it. So I'm just saying, again, Whitney and I are not clinically licensed therapists. We're not physicians. We're not herbalists. But the danger in trying things without supervision or guidance is you can try something like lithium and do some damage to yourself if you're doing a higher dosage than what your body needs. So to back up what Whitney said, do this with an abundance of caution. Find a really good holistic doctor if you can in your area and do these things gradually and slowly. That's yeah. our, I, would you agree? And try not to self-diagnose either. I, I can't remember how much I have shared publicly on the podcast about my curiosity about ADHD. I set, had an appointment with a psychiatrist because that was what my doctor recommended as a starting point. And when I got to the appointment, the psychiatrist disclosed that she was not able to officially evaluate me. She did listen to me explain my symptoms. And then she said she suspected I didn't have ADHD, but she wasn't able to fully conclude that. My point of bringing this up is that it's it can be a long process. J Jason's a great example of this. I mean, he's been trying to get to the root of his mental health challenges for a long time. I've, I've witnessed it myself from for as long as we've known each other. And it can be very frustrating. And I think sometimes it's easy to take a shortcut and try to like fix it yourself or self-diagnose. But having the patience to do a lot of trial and error, which is actually this psychiatrist, she was recommending instead of um, before I got evaluated or instead of getting evaluated for ADHD that I... Uh, seek out regular therapy. And it didn't sound like she was the best fit for me on my needs. And she said very openly to me that it's going to take a lot of trial and error to find the right therapist for me. And I really appreciated her saying that to me because, first of all, she it didn't seem like I needed a psychiatrist uh, specifically. Um, they are able to prescribe medication. But Going to a different type of therapist who might not be able to prescribe medication could actually help you work through the emotional elements, which she thinks is the main thing that I need right now. Um, and I appreciated her reminding me that it's going to take some trial and error because I've actually been hesitant for the past few years to go back to therapy after feeling like I was striking out with therapists. and. I know I've seen at least three therapists over the years. The very first one I saw was wonderful. She was a psychiatrist and she really helped me out. I mean, I lucked out by finding her. And then I remember the second one, I think, like just we didn't connect and I didn't feel like she understood me and it felt really frustrating. I didn't want to continue seeing her. And then I don't remember if there was another one that I tried out, but I do remember about Three years ago, I tried another therapist and there was like zero connection. I think I did two sessions with her. I didn't feel like it helped me at all. And it was so frustrating that I didn't seek out therapy in the past three years. But seeing the psychiatrist just a few weeks ago, she really thinks that that would be helpful for me in more ways than I even recognized. And I think that, that I was in a combination, Jason, of like denial about how impactful therapy would be for me because I had this idea, which to be honest, was a little like in my ego, I suppose, of like, I don't need therapy. I read self-help books and personal development books and wellness books all the time. I have this podcast. Like, I was like, what's a therapist going to do for me? Because 
I feel like I'm teaching myself these things all the time. And that mentality was also stemming from the fact that in those last few experiences that I had, because they weren't the right fit, I felt like I could help myself more than someone else could help me. And I think the same can be true with medication, whether it's natural, holistic, herbal versus pharmaceutical, is that sometimes we can try something and if it doesn't work for us right away, we're like, well, that doesn't work for us. But to your point, Jason, the dosage of medication, regardless of its source, is incredibly important. And that's exactly why working with a professional who can guide you through is so key. And it took me a very long time to realize this. So now I want to embark upon um, using my desire to self-diagnose as a clue that I can bring to a professional and say, hey, what do you think about this? And I think in general, that can be helpful because sometimes a doctor has not heard of something, but they may be willing to explore it with you to decide if it's a good fit. There have been many times that I've brought something to a doctor's attention and they said, hmm, I didn't consider that, right? Like, so you can do it together. That's where I'm at right now uh, on my journey of figuring out my own mental health is like trial and error plus like there's nothing wrong with doing the explorations that we're doing right now in something like Ghost Pipe. But now I know, let me bring this to my doctor next and see what they think. And also finding a doctor who's willing to explore these different elements of Eastern and Western treatments. I want to reflect back to you what you said about coming from your ego and reading the books and taking the courses and doing self-study and being on your path and thinking, what the hell's therapy going to do for me? I had a very similar mentality prior to seeing my therapist, Gary. It was one of the reasons that I didn't seek out therapy sooner. If I really look back on my history with mental health and depression and suicidal ideation, I could have really benefited from going years earlier. But the reason I didn't is because of my ego. It was, I'm a wellness practitioner. I lecture all over the world talking about food and functional nutrition. I don't need a fucking therapist. Look, look, you know, it was so much like, I'm Jason Robel, blah, blah, blah. Look who I am. I'm some big deal. But it prevented me, that ego you're talking about, Whitney, prevented me from getting help years prior who knows what the outcome would have been had I had I gone when I really first started to feel that deep depression and, and those incessant suicidal thoughts. But I really could have benefited, you know, three to four years prior to when I actually went. I, I first started going to therapy in 2014. But if I'm honest about it, I could have easily started going in 2009, 2010. So it was that ego part of me of not being able to admit that I also needed help. You know, there's this sort of archetype of, you know, heal or heal thyself, that a lot of people who are drawn to wellness, the healing arts, nutrition, holistic practitioner, you know, holistic practices rather, um, are because they're in need of healing as well. And I think that I certainly fit into that archetype is, you know, now I'm, seven years into doing therapy. I'm seven years into having a very intense and regimented approach to figuring this out for myself. But had I let go of my ego, I would have done it sooner. The other thing too, I want to say is, you know, when, when we're talking about experimenting with new herbs, new vitamins, new minerals, if one wants to go to the pharmaceutical route, we're certainly not judging your choices here. Um, what works for one person may not work for you. And I've done this where people were like, um, oh, you know, you need to try L-theanine. And, and I think you recently were, you know, telling me that a member of your family had tried it and it benefited her. And I actually went on it for about a month and a half and I didn't notice anything. So the relentless willingness to experiment with this and see what works for your individual biochemistry, I think is a critical point to make here. And it's one of the it's one of the issues that I have, and I've done this a million times. So when I say this, I am also certainly uh, looking at myself. When we go into a Whole Foods or a natural foods market, and we go to the supplement section, and we talk to the person working at 
whole foods at all. And we say, yeah, you know, I've, I've been struggling with depression. I've been struggling with brain fog. I don't really feel well. Can you recommend something? And they just give you a formula off the shelf. I know that everyone's intentions are probably, I would assume for the best here, but the danger again is it's the analogy I like to use is putting a blindfold on and trying to hit the bullseye on a dartboard. I don't know. It could be tryptophan. It could be L-theanine. It could be your B-complex vitamins. It could be your D3. Here, just take all this shit. Well, when you when you go in and do that approach and you have like four different formulas with all this stuff, you don't know which vitamin or nutrient in said supplement is actually giving you the boost or not. So it all goes back to, I, I think having guidance on this journey is important. Because we could just do a shotgun approach and not know what the hell is working or isn't working. I say that out of total experience. And for me, I don't go to the natural food store now, Whitney, unless I know exactly what I'm going in for and and I am well informed on what that may do to assist me. I'm not just going in blind and asking. Like I literally never ask the employees, no disrespect to the employees, but they're not doctors and they're not herbalists. Right. I also, before I forget, that reminds me of how incredibly helpful it is to track your symptoms, track your energy, your mood. I've mentioned this on This Hits the Spot, which is our private podcast. And for those of you that don't know about it yet, uh, This Hits the Spot is like all of our product recommendations, services, anything that we're loving. It's a very positive, uplifting, and shorter version of this podcast which you can get by signing up for our newsletter or supporting us on Patreon. We will link to This Hits the Spot in the show notes. You can also find it by by Googling This Hits the Spot podcast, and it gives you all the details on it. And on one of those episodes, I talked about this app called Bearable that I started trying out, and it has been a game changer for me. I love this app so much. If you want to hear all the details on it, go check out the This Hits the Spot episode. But I'll just say real quick, Jason, that I've been tracking my mood and my energy and what I'm taking every single day, especially because in in full disclosure, and I, you know, I feel a little unsure about sharing this, but I'll, I, I mean, I'm here to be transparent, is that I'm experimenting with a pharmaceutical medication right now. And I think it's important for me to say that because First of all, I think any fear I have is just somebody judging me like, how dare you? People have judged me for getting the COVID vaccine. And it actually was like helpful to receive judgment on that, Jason, because I know that I feel good about getting the vaccine. I know that I spent time researching it and I made the decision that was best for me. I do not regret it whatsoever at this point. Now, it's possible I may have long-term health impacts from it. I am open to that. But for me, the pros of the vaccine outweighed getting the cons. And so whenever someone, which has not happened a lot, but I've had a few people, or I don't even know if it's a few people. I've had a few, (laughs) a few expressions, I will say, of, I can't believe you got the vaccine. I thought you were really, you know, wellness minded. First of all, I don't think that's mutually exclusive. um, And I'm not here to get on my pedestal about the vaccine. I'm saying that that pushback I received was helpful in me feeling more confident about my decisions. And I've struggled my whole life with trusting my decisions. I've struggled with regret and shame. And now I'm working on owning up to my decisions, especially when they're permanent decisions. You can't take back getting the vaccine. What I can take back in some ways um, is choosing how long I I experiment with a pharmaceutical drug. At this moment, I'm not comfortable sharing which one I'm taking, but it was prescribed to me by my doctor. We talked through it. I did a lot of research and I looked at my symptoms, which I've been tracking. And I said, all right, I want to know if this will help me. Now, if it does help me, I've got some an option for myself. If it doesn't help me, I can experiment with something else. Also, if it does help me, that doesn't mean I have to stick with it. I can just know where I need support and I can look for other alternatives. I think that's another important element of this conversation, Jason. It's like experimenting and having flexibility and a willingness also is part of 
the ego conversation because I've definitely gone through all sorts of phases with my ego in terms of judgments. And it's tough to work through all the variables. And I've learned to have a lot of compassion. Decision fatigue is a huge issue. A lot of people don't have the stamina, or I should say, not many people have the stamina to weigh out all the options for themselves, especially when mental health is a concern. Sometimes you do not know until you try something. Now, I, going back to the vaccine just briefly, and this is timely because it's, we're recording this episode at the end of July. This episode comes out in August. We have no idea what's going to happen between the day we're recording this and the day it releases. Coronavirus, COVID-19 is, if I've learned anything from it, is that we do not know that much about it. Every single day, I see some new news about it that surprises me. And it's just one of those things that I've, I'm like recognizing my own ego involved with that, but other people's ego. And I think to have your ego involved at all with something as serious as COVID-19 is very dangerous. And the same thing is true with mental health. Because when your ego gets in the way, it can be a matter of life or death in these cases, truly. So I feel like it's important to have mental flexibility for yourself and your decisions, to have patience, knowing that this is a long-term process, and also recognize that there's a lot of experience, experimenting and unknown. And I don't think it has served me to get so overwhelmed to the point that I don't try anything. That actually is been harder on my mental health. When I've leaned into things and had the willingness to change my mind, the willingness to experiment, that's actually where I get more answers. And I think a lot of these like perspectives on like what you should or shouldn't do, like even a doctor struggles to give you the right information. So if like these people that have dedicated their whole lives to studying health still do not have a definite answer, you know, we're all figuring this out. And I think that's a really important part of this conversation. And and I want to urge you, the listener, to do your best not to judge others for the decisions they're making. Because as I've monitored my mood, going back to all of that, tracking it, the more I've like studied things like ADHD and neurodivergence in the brain, I've also learned, Jason, that so many people approach life differently based on the way that their brains work. And you can't assume that the way you process information and make decisions is the same as somebody else. I think it's really unfortunate when friends, family members, anyone in your life comes to you and, or even to your point, Jason, somebody at at a natural food store tries to project onto you their own beliefs and their own decision-making, especially if you're someone in a vulnerable position who's trying to figure out what's best versus the psychiatrist that I saw recently did such a beautiful job at listening to me, asking some questions, and giving me some options while also acknowledging that each option was not definite. And she even used the term that there's no magic pill. And I was so grateful when she said that to me because there's such a tendency for us to try to find some magic to make ourselves feel better. But I could tell this woman had a lot of experiment experience and she still was like, I don't know what's going to work for you. You're going to have to try some things. And here are some places I recommend that you start. That works really well for me in terms of an approach to what's going to make me feel better. Isn't that the goal? Feeling better? I mean, why, why do we go work with a therapist, shaman, doctor, healer in the first place? We want to feel better. I, I think that what you're describing, Whitney, is one of the most innate primal human drives. It's not escapism from pain. It's just that I think when we are suffering for a long enough period of time with a mental or physical malady, 
it's our natural inclination to want to feel better, to want, I, I think not just want to feel better, but want relief, like specifically relief. And when we talk about other people's judgments of how we, if we are suffering, because I do believe on whatever level, every human being on the planet who is alive and who has ever lived has suffered. Every human being. So engendering that compassion, that's my belief, knowing that people who are strangers to us are silently suffering with something we don't know. When you and I, Whitney, have received emails, I've received a litany of DMs from people who are, in the case of mental health, uh, you know, you should definitely not do pharmaceuticals because SSRIs will addict you. They'll co-opt your serotonin production. You'll be addicted. The come down is horrible. All of that. Other people saying, no, no, no. Like pharmaceuticals have saved me. I have friends, artists who said this was the last thing. And I went on a pharmaceutical and it literally saved me from killing myself. Okay. And then when you break down the vaccine as sort of a mirror of that, we've received messages from people, um, specifically criticizing the fact that we talk openly about vaccines, that we're not anti-vax, that you've actually received it. We've had critical messages like that. I've had critical messages from pro-vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, the whole lot. I mean, it continues. I've had people message me, Whitney. I've had probably close to 10 people like, what's your opinion on the vaccine? I'm like, first of all, I'm not a doctor or a virologist or a biologist. I'm a chef with a nutrition background, right? Like there's part of me that's like, the fuck are you asking me for? I'm, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I haven't worked in a lab with viruses. So I'm very careful with my interactions with people because people have so much agenda wrapped up, up in all this. And I think their agenda is they want to be right. Why do they want to be right? Because if they're right, they will feel safe and in control. And by feeling safe and in control, they feel better. So we're going back around to this primal urge of humanity, not wanting to be afraid, not wanting to suffer, not wanting to be in pain. And I think when people anchor themselves to such certainty about what is happening in the world, and they really, really believe their narrative, well, they feel safer and more secure. I'm at a point kind of like going back to Alan Watts, who I've referenced many times on this podcast, one of my favorite authors and lecturers. He has this incredible book that we'll link to in the show notes at wellevator.com called The Wisdom of Insecurity. And his point is, you want to know because ultimately you're afraid of death. The most primal fear of humanity is dying. Even if it's ego death and you being very, very, very wrong about what you think is real is a form of psychological or spiritual death to you, your perception of it. So we try to inoculate ourselves against ego death by being right and being self-righteous. So the pro-vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers, everyone who's like, you're wrong, I'm right, fuck you. They're doing it because they're fucking afraid, I believe, because they're afraid. They probably wouldn't, I'm not afraid, I'm a warrior, I'm standing for truth. Sure. Sure, Frank. Sure you are. Uh, I think people are really terrified and they're unwilling to admit it. That's what I think. It's my opinion. I I can see where you're coming from. And, you know, I actually, as, as I mentioned, have found that process of experiencing COVID to be incredibly, and, and by which I mean, I don't, to my knowledge, I do not, I've never, I have not had COVID. Um, what I mean is being in this time of a pandemic has been really mentally expanding for me, Jason, because I have gone through so many different perspectives on it. I've experienced seeing gaslighting a ton the, I mean, and and that was such a great lesson for me because it it like revealed where my insecurities were, and it revealed to me where my boundaries are. And every single friend of mine has approached COVID very differently, in terms of strong beliefs or neutral beliefs, or deciding to get the vaccine versus not. Um, people that treated masking and staying at home very differently than others. And it was like, whoa, a very in-my-face lesson of how every single person is different. 
Not one person that I know in my life has reacted to COVID the same. What a beautiful thing to note, take note of. We're not all on the same page. And that's okay. Now, it's tricky because right now, as of the time we're recording this, at the end of July 2021, there's a lot of pressure for us to come together to resolve this. But we, at the same time, we don't know if any of those measures are actually going to have a long-term impact. Time is a huge element of this too. So there's been a lot of encouragement to get the vaccine. And now we're finding out that the vaccine uh, may not be as protective as some people have believed. And that's interesting. Does that make me regret getting it? Absolutely not. Because right now my perspective is I feel grateful that I got it because I feel like from the data that I've seen thus far, that that reduces my chance of getting hospitalized. And as COVID has gone on, I've recognized I really don't want to get COVID. Like I, I know people that have had COVID. It sounds very miserable. I would prefer not to suffer in that way, you know, but I also recognize that I, even though I have the vaccine, that I may still get it and I may still suffer. So also to your point, Jason, like I think there was this mentality of I'm going to get the vaccine and I'm not going to get COVID or, you know, or the symptoms are going to be so minimal. I won't even notice them. Turns out that might not be true. <laughs> so the the constant examples of we don't know, we don't have all the answers yet and they may be temporary answers and then things may change. The other thing is that it it helped me recognize and give me the ability to kind of bite my tongue at times, Jason. This past week, I've started to feel really concerned about COVID again, which is unfortunate. I felt like when I got the vaccine, which was in, I was fully vaccinated in mid-June, I think. It was like a sigh of relief. And from a mental ha- stand from a mental health standpoint, that felt really good. It it did to your point earlier, the word relief. I experienced a lot of that. I was like, oh. And I remember like going out and and the CDC was saying, if you're vaccinated, you don't, you don't have to wear your mask at all. And it was like, wow, this is so relieving. I'm so grateful. <laughs> like it felt so good to go to a grocery store and hang out with friends and like travel a bit. And it was like a few weeks after I finally like let up and and felt all that relief, things started to change again. And now in the past week, I'm like, well, back to wearing my mask all the time. Well, back to not socializing as much, back to physical distancing. And it's a bummer. And I have needed to bite my tongue, though, because... You know, to be honest, Jason, I've had to bite my tongue a number of times with you because I've I've wanted to like send you things and, and be like, are you sure you don't want to get the vaccine? Like everybody's saying to get the vaccine now. Like I'm worried about you. Like I get scared sometimes for you and other friends that have still not chosen to get the vaccine. I'm really afraid that if you got it, that you would be hospitalized and maybe die from it. Like I have that fear. Whether that fear is fully valid, I don't know. I do know that I'm picking it up from information. Whether that information is fully valid, I also don't know. But I have that fear, and that fear is valid, right? Meaning it's valid for me. Like when we have fear, that's like our own interpretation of information that we're getting. And so even though I have that fear, I've still found the strength to know that that's my fear, not yours, and that I have learned through other people's reactions to me and pressures and judgment. I don't want to pass that on to others. So, yeah, like it. This past week has been rough, and I'm scared for friends of mine who've chosen not to get the vaccine. But it's not my place to make that decision for them or judge them for their decisions. 
And that's been a really important lesson for me. I'm glad that you said that, Whitney. And have I felt pressure? I haven't. I haven't felt pressure around it to be vaccinated. Um, and I think I've mentioned this on previous episodes. You know, I received my essential vaccines as a child. I, prior to my surgery last November after my motorcycle accident, I, the hospital required me to get a flu vaccine because one of the shards of bone was dangerously close to puncturing my lung. And they were like, look, we don't want your lung to collapse, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, fine. It's like, I'm not going to sit here with a broken body. You need to do the surgery. So give me the shot. So that being said, politically speaking, I'm not pro or anti. I'm, I, my stance on this is each person having informed consent and doing what they feel in terms of logic and intuition, either or, or both, leads them to do. Now, I've had some people say, well, how are we going to get to herd immunity? If everyone's a rugged individualist, and that seems to be the capitalist Western mindset is everyone's out for themselves, which I do agree with. I think that is an intrinsic part of one of the problems of a toxic capitalist Western mentality is this is my thing and this is my way and fuck everyone else. I mean, the, we, we do have a very rugged American sort of frame on life in that way, which I think in some ways has led to some incredible innovations and wonderful breakthroughs in humanity, that mindset, but in other ways has caused a, a, a lot of issues. You know, we won't get into all those issues. There's, there's too many to discuss right in this moment, but I think, Whitney, um, speaking of mindset, one of the things that I take umbrage with that I think is scientifically inaccurate with this whole conversation is when people frame, conc I've heard phrases like, we need to conquer COVID. We need to, we need to beat COVID. We need to destroy COVID. These are all very American sort of concepts. When we perceive a threat, what do we do? I mean, historically, what have we done? We've killed a lot of people, haven't we? We've gone in, we've bombed people, we've dropped, we've dropped nuclear warheads on countries, we've occupied different countries that, in my opinion, we had no fucking business being there. We, we, we as okay, and people are going. Jason's anti-American. I'm not anti-American. I'm anti-colonialism. I'm anti-war, unnecessarily so. And I think the American way historically speaking, has been to go in and destroy things when we perceive them as a threat. But here's the rub. If we look at a hundred years ago with the Spanish flu and what happened with that, I didn't know this until I did some research. I had no idea this was the case. The influenza virus, the regular seasonal flu that we all know since childhood, right? That is a weakened version of the original influenza virus that started 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. I never knew that. So this idea that we are going to, quote, eradicate COVID, beat COVID, kill COVID, it's not, I'm, again, not a virologist, but looking scientifically at other virulent strains, we're not going to kill it or destroy it. It's going to continue to be around. Perhaps, if you look at the predictability models, much like the 100 plus years we've been living with the Spanish flu. That is now the seasonal flu we all get, right? So it could be that 50, 70, 100 years from now, COVID is like the seasonal flu. We'll get it. We'll feel like shit. It probably won't kill us. So I understand the idea of wanting to achieve, quote, herd immunity. But this erroneous mentality, we're going to beat it, kill it, or conquer it, is simply not true scientifically. We may dilute it. It may, over the years, mutate, and we get these variants. Of course, everyone's going crazy over Delta now, but everybody, the science shows it's not, quote, going away. I think it's going to be with us God knows how long. We've been, what, over 100 years with the regular seasonal flu? So I want to make that point. I think, I think the umbrage I take, Whitney, with this fight against COVID is we're not going to destroy it. We might build immunity toward it. We might weaken the severity of the response in our bodies, but we're not beating this thing into oblivion to where it never comes back again. That's simply a misnomer. 
Well, on that note, I'm curious. And first of all, I want to ask your permission because you don't have to answer this, especially because we're talking about this publicly. But if you're willing to share your thought process, you know, where are you now with with this? And you said you don't feel pressure. From my perspective, and again, this is this is truly from my perspective and the and the sources that I've been exposed to. From my perspective, it feels a bit frightening. And I'm curious, do you have fear about getting COVID? Do you have any thought in your head of like, well, what if I got COVID? What if I was went into the hospital? Um, and like, given that so many people around you have chosen to get the vaccine, Jason, like where, why are you still hesitant about it? And is there any part of you that's considering it or do you feel like you've kind of made up your mind? Is it a temporary makeup? I'm just, I'm, I'm actually very curious. Um, cause you're not the only one I know, uh, some very, well, I don't want to like put people in categories, but people I, I really respect and trust and like know that they're not just hesitant because of like some, unconscious fear, but like they've really weighed out the pros and cons for themselves and decided that they don't want to get it. So I'm curious about that. And I'm also curious, like, are you taking measures to prevent yourself from getting COVID or, or are you just like a little bit more relaxed and like, I'm, I'm either going to get it or I'm not, and I'm not concerned if I get it. Like, where are you at from all those different points of view? Because to give you a framework, I mean, today I went out to get breakfast. And I felt so uncomfortable being out. Like I felt, I felt uncomfortable walking down the street because there were a number of people like not wearing masks. And I'm just like, we're in Los Angeles. (sighs) Who knows? Like there's that, there's that fear of all the unknown, Jason, that's like, it's starting to make me feel very scared about being around strangers and scared around about being around people who are more relaxed about COVID than me. And it sucks to be back in that place. But th- just to be honest, that's where I'm at as of today. I'm I'm afraid of getting COVID. I really am. And it's stressful to me. And I'd rather socially isolate myself for some more time than experience that stress because I just really don't want to get COVID. I'm scared of the long-term and the short-term elements of it. So with all that said, I'm curious about where you're at with it mentally and if you have any fear. Do you have fear of the vaccine? Do you have fear of getting COVID? Like, I want to know it all if you're open to sharing it. Yeah, I'm happy to share. I I just want to figure out where I want to begin with all of it. Um, First and foremost, for any listeners of the podcast who've been with us over the past week or two, I've been sick. And if you've seen me on our YouTube channel, blowing my nose, you know, turning away from the microphone and coughing, I I have either had the cold or the flu for the past two weeks. Today, at the day of this recording, it's been two weeks. And I went to go get a COVID test. It was negative. But I was concerned, Whitney, because the first, say, four days, I was coughing up all kinds of rainbow phlegm, my breath was short. I was having sweats. I was having fever. You know, and I'm looking at the sort of the symptoms of COVID-19 going, oh, a lot of these check out. Um, after two weeks, I feel good. Uh, I have been quarantining at home, not just in case I had COVID, but if I have the cold or the flu, I don't want to pass it to anyone. So I've only left the house twice in the past two weeks. I've left my house twice in the past two weeks to go to the natural food store to get vitamin C, elderberry, echinacea, zinc, the whole shop. The whole time that this has been going on, I feel like I have been really adamant about wearing a mask in public, washing my hands, using sanitizer, doing those protocols. People have asked me like, well, well, don't you feel like your civil liberties are being taken away by being asked to wear a mask everywhere? I don't mind wearing a mask. I have a really comfortable mask. It's comfortable on my face. It's made from organic cotton and silver threads, right? There's actually silver embedded. I have three, uh, excuse me, I have three layers in it. Like I, wearing a mask is not a big deal to me. Some people are very up in arms about it from, from a liberty and a freedom perspective. I don't give a shit. You want me to wear a mask? Fine. Don't care. 
the issue and the reason that I have not been vaccinated yet, Whitney, is I read articles every single day and I see videos every single day about this. And I feel that from a perspective of the efficacy of the vaccines themselves, we are technically, scientifically speaking, this is from Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, we are, quote, currently in a clinical trial. What is happening right now on the planet is technically a public clinical trial. That means that the FDA has approved these for emergency use only. They have not been fully authorized by the Food and Drug Administration. That's fact. I'm only going to say what I know to be as fact right now when we talk about it. The other thing is the information changes so frequently that, in fact, a couple of days ago at the time of this recording, the CDC issued an article saying that they are investigating more research that it could be that fully vaccinated people have similar or potentially even equal amounts of viral load as unvaccinated people. Well, that's interesting because to this point, I was under the impression that getting the vaccine meant that the viral load was decreased and therefore the transmissibility was reduced. However, the CDC says that may not be the case. Now then, okay, if I look at that, and if that is true scientifically, viral load could be similar or equal, Transmiss transmissibility of the virus is not significantly reduced, then I go, hmm, well, those are two strikes against getting the vaccine, from my opinion. The other part of it, the big one has been a reduction in mortality risk or long-term hospitalization, which apparently that is still the case scientifically, that if you get the vaccine, your symptoms and the risk of hospitalization, as far as I understand it in this moment, that seems to be holding water. Now, this goes back to fear, though, right? Because if I'm looking at it and I go, the viral load thing looks to maybe be a wash, the transmiss transmissibility looks to be a wash, but maybe I will reduce my risk of death or hospitalization. Okay. Well, then it comes down to, am I more afraid of getting full-blown COVID or more afraid of the potential side effects of an experimental vaccine that is not fully approved by the Food and Drug Administration? What am I more afraid of? Well, the reality is, at this moment, I'm more afraid of the potential side effects of an experimental vaccine than I am getting COVID. That's where I'm at right now, and that is why I'm not vaccinated. Could I get COVID? Yeah. Could I be hospitalized? Yes. Could I die? Yes. Could I also get the vaccine and get, God knows, permanent facial paralysis like a colleague of ours? Could I get tremors and neurological disorders like I've seen? There, there are videos out there, Whitney, that are that are heartbreaking. They're heartbreaking. People have been posting in their children, their teenagers and 20-somethings and older um, tremors, uncontrollable body shakes, neurological disorders, body paralysis as side effects of these vaccines. I'm not saying that that is a guaranteed outcome when I say this. And when I say this, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. But where I'm at right now is my fear of having permanent neurological damage or bodily harm is greater than my fear of contracting COVID-19. That's where I'm at in this moment. And thank you for sharing that. And it's interesting too, because I have not seen any of those videos. And, and this is part of why I asked is we can so easily get in a bubble and we just see the same information over and over again. And, and the information in my bubble is leaning towards provax it's leaning towards covid fear it's leaning towards a lot of like stress and anxiety about it and i recognize that um i also feel hesitant about you know some of the videos that you're seeing like i question i find myself questioning them a lot not to say that i don't believe them but i'm questioning them and that is coming from i i guess i uh, a bias towards some of the anti-vax. I, I know a number of people personally that are anti-vax and they, it seems very extreme. I tend to shy away from extreme things. I don't want anyone to force me or others to do things. I don't want anyone to have an, like, I don't enjoy the all or nothing perspectives. And I think you and I really agree on that, Jason. And so it's fascinating. I'm willing to see 
opposite perspectives as mine. Absolutely. You know, I, and again, I've already chosen to get the vaccine. So as far as I'm aware, there's no turning back. Um, and I, I hear what you're saying. And you, I mean, it comes down to the fact that you and I just have different perspectives. I'm more afraid of the long-term effects of COVID for which they're start, they're still figuring this out. But, you know, some people have, and have, these studies are showing the, that for many months or a year now since it's been around, that it is long-lasting impacts of which I don't want to experience. Like the person I know who is ex- I'm extremely close to, but I'll I'll protect their associations to me um, out of privacy sake. But someone very very near and dear to me got COVID after being vaccinated spread it. Um, well, I guess this, they don't know for sure that they spread it, but someone else in their work environment also got it. So maybe they got it from one another. And the day-to-day experience that this person is having in just the past week just sounds like nothing I would like to experience. And so it's like interesting, you know, like that. that's kind of what it comes down to for me, Jason. And I think like you articulated it so well. We have different. I would rather not get COVID, and I would rather take my chances with the vaccine. Thus far, I have had zero symptoms from the vaccine that I'm aware of. I've been to the doctor. I've had my blood work done. I've been to uh, a body worker. I've I've I have like seen a psychiatrist. I've seen like three different professionals since I got the vaccine, and as far as I know, I'm all checked out. Um, that doesn't mean that I won't have some long-term effect like you're explaining, Jason. Um, so it almost feels like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Do you feel that way? Like It's kind of like if you get COVID, it could be really bad. But if you get the vaccine, it could be really bad. And I think ultimately it comes down to where do you feel the most comfortable taking your risks? Unless you just want to like completely isolate yourself, I guess like that's the other option is literally don't see anybody and just get everything delivered. But even then it's like, is having things delivered to you still risky? Who the hell knows? I guess you could like it for anyone who saw the, the show sweet tooth. Um, this isn't a spoiler, but there is a virus in, in that show. And, um, one of the characters completely goes off to isolate himself And like grows his own food and is just like out in the wilderness. And I'm not at a place in my life where I want to do that. So I chose to, in my opinion, the lesser of two evils. And it sounds like you have too, Jason. Well, I just want to say I'm much closer than you to wanting to go out into the woods and take all of my animals and grow my own food and be like, deuces, I'm, I'm way closer to that how that will manifest in my life remains to be seen, but I I'm, I'm really done with city life. We've talked about this in previous episodes of my, my visions and my plans for moving. If you want to get into that, we'll link to that episode in the show notes as well at wellevator.com. I think what you're describing Whitney is where do you want to put your bet on the blackjack table? Am I gambling by not being vaccinated? Sure. I'm well aware of it. Am I also gambling by being fully vaccinated? Damn right. So it's really about where I'm putting my chips on the blackjack table right now is what's happening. And I'm fully aware that I am risking something by one of those two approaches. And I, I suppose for me, it's a daily exploration into where am I putting my proverbial chips? You know, and the other thing I want to say is I mentioned the word informed consent when you were asking me about my perspective and why I'm choosing what I'm choosing with the vaccine. I, through friends of ours who have sent me the ingredient lists in the vaccines, because they knew that for me, I'm obviously very mindful of what I put in my body, not just in terms of supplements, the water I drink, the food that I eat. For years, I have been a staunch label reader. I'm I'm very much like our friend and former guest, Vani Hari, the food babe, very adamant about researching foods, ingredients, additives, preservatives. I want to know what is this thing I'm putting into my body? Well, that being said, 
with these ingredient lists for all three of the major vaccines. In particular, though, the ones that are using the mRNA technology, the Pfizer and Moderna, they have disclosed their ingredient list. They have. And I've researched actually some of the preservatives, some of the stabilizers, things like that. Those don't concern me too much. What concerns me is they are not publicly disclosing the ingredients for which they have used to sequence the mRNA gene code that they are putting in the vaccine. People have asked. They said, you need to disclose these to the public. What what are you using to synthesize and create the genetic code for the mRNA strain that you're putting in the vaccine? They say, we won't tell you. And people have said, groups have said, why won't you tell us? They said, it's proprietary and it's intellectual property. It's our IP. They said, well, <laughs> you have to release that to the public. And they said, actually, legally, we don't have to, and they don't have to. So my concern is they're waving the flag and hunkering down into the fact that they have intellectual property over the ingredients and the technology and the sequence that's that's gone in to create the mRNA. I want to know what it is. I think probably millions of people want to know. Is it aborted fetal tissue? Is it human derived? Is it animal derived? Is it from cadavers? We don't know because the corporations won't release it to the public. That's a huge red flag to me. Now, I know they're saying it under the guise of, well, we need to protect our profits and we need to protect our IP. I get that from a corporate perspective. They want to maximize their billions. But in terms of informed consent with a public who is currently in a clinical trial testing phase, if you're not going to tell me what you've used to create the genetic sequence that's the sequence that's going in my body, that's a big red flag to me. Will they ever release it? We don't know. But that's my biggest concern. When I look at the ingredient list, Whitney, that very intentional omission concerns the shit out of me. That's another reason I haven't taken it. They, they refuse to release it to the public. Under, I mean, I think everything that you've shared is valid to me, even though I've made a different decision. And I hope that our conversation about this has demonstrated to others that you can feel strongly or neutral about something. You can make a decision and still respect people that make a different decision. And unlike some other things like your diet, you can't really change whether you can't take back getting the vaccine, like I said. So I'm still interested and I'm still open. I mean, listen, I could have made a big health mistake. I could not, I could find that out later on, on in my life. I, I really have no idea, but I, that was another thing too, is I'm not going to like choose ignorance over my decisions. Um, I'm, I'm very open to quote, like finding out that I might've not made the best choice, but that's true with so much in life. You know, it's like a sliding doors thing. It's like, well, what if I had done this? What if I had done that? And I guess that revealed within me that I've I've made a lot of progress because I've spent so much of my life trying to do the right thing that based on what other people thought was the right thing. And now I'm getting to the place where I'm really just doing the right thing for me. And so much, so many times. I found myself like wanting to get permission, like, okay, let me just see, do other people agree with my decision? And I would feel so frustrated when someone would go, I, you know, it's up to you. Like, I, I couldn't stand that. The truth is it really is up to us for the most part, um, at least up until now. I mean, it's it's also possible, Jason, like <laughs> jobs are now requiring the vaccine, like there's a lot of now proof of vaccination trends happening, um, which I don't fully agree with. I can understand why companies, but I think it's just a lot of fear, a lot of pressure. Fortunately, it seems like there are plenty of places that are saying proof of vaccine or a negative COVID test. And I hope it stays that way because for the sake of someone like you, Jason, I believe in your right to choose what you insert into your body, even though, you know, there might be ramifications. Like, I still believe that you should be able to choose. And I don't feel comfortable living in a, in a place where the government or p other people 
pressure you or force you into doing something. I'm not okay with that. Having our own free will is incredibly important to me. And my hope is that it stays that way. But I also hope that we get enough data to show where the risks are, you know, and have more guidance because it is unfortunate to me that we're not in sync. And there's plenty of people walking around right now without masks on, even though in cities like Los Angeles, we have the mask mandate again. And that to me is frustrating because I would like us all to be on the same page when it comes to masks. Yes, I see what you, you know, some people say about their freedom, but like wearing a mask is such a minimal thing. And from my perspective, the desire to not wear a mask just feels like an act of rebellion. I have not been convinced enough as to why not wearing a mask. It's like, if anything, I'm pro, super pro mask <laughs> like, uh, because I just feel like what's the harm in wearing one? Yeah, I don't I don't find them super comfortable, to be honest. I don't like the way it feels to breathe in a mask or talk. <laughs> when I went, I don't think I told you this, Jason. I went to um, a Panda Express uh, to try the new Beyond Meat orange chicken that they have there. Just thought it'd be fun. And, you know, everybody in there was wearing masks. And I asked a question about one of the other dishes uh, because I, I – I don't even know if I'd ever been to Panda Express, certainly not since I went vegan. And so I don't know, like, do they use animal products in their greens? And I'm shouting over the the counter to the woman on the other side, like, is it vegan? And she could not understand me over and over again. Is it vegan? Is it vegan? And it was something about the word vegan that my mask was like preventing her from understanding me. And it was so frustrating. And I I remember last year I was in a grocery store and I had a similar experience and I I completely uh as a knee jerk reaction like pulled down my mask and asked the question and then I was like oh no I can't believe I just did that. I did not do that at Panda Express. I've learned not to, but it was, you know, I get it. Like the, wearing a mask is not like a walk in the park, you know? It it's uncomfortable at times. But it seems like a relatively easy thing to do to protect your health and that of others, from my opinion. That's a whole nother topic. Um, thank you for having this discussion, JC. My last question for you is, what what were you planning to talk about today before we got into this? Because I thought we were just going to like talk about ghost pipe and then like completely switch directions. Do you want to share what the topic was or should we leave it for next time? We could do it as a teaser. I'll tease it because I feel okay. like it is apropos of this conversation. I kind of figured it would be. I was like, I have a feeling there's going to be some sort of like segue transition into your topic, which we will say we're not going to get into it now, but maybe we can discuss it on the next episode. Yeah. So the thing I want to discuss is um, the mechanics and the psychology of overcoming and dealing with regret. And awesome. I feel like that's interesting, Whitney, because we are talking about health. We're talking about health choices. Um, I've been really ruminating on a lot of regrets in my life lately. And I want to dissect regret, the feelings of regret, and also share some tips that I've been reading on how to overcome really, really serious regrets. So that's our next episode of This Might Get Uncomfortable. If you enjoyed what you heard, Please share this episode, share it with your friends, spread the word. We have so many ways to do that, whether that's through our Instagram or our Facebook group at Wellevator. You can join there and you can follow along with our social media posts. You can also shoot Whitney and myself a direct email. If you have any thoughts, feelings, musings, remarks on the subject today, it's hello at wellevator.com. And that's also, again, our website, which is the hub for our show notes, all of our resources, Links to our podcast are also there now. We have a really great new podcast section on our main website. And we also have a bunch of free resources for your wellness and well-being. That's at wellevator.com, W-E-L-L-E-V-A-T-R.com. So stay tuned for the next episode. We're going to be breaking down the mechanics of how to deal with regret in your life. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of regrets I've been struggling with lately. So it's probably going to be a 
you know, full of some tears. So if that's your kind of thing, <laughs> then definitely join us to see me cry on the podcast or hear me cry. Uh, and we also, as Whitney mentioned, have a much lighter, uh, joy-filled private podcast called This Hits the Spot, full of our favorite new products, services, supplements, foods, recommendations. And you can join that as being a Patreon member, a patron of ours, for as low as $2 a month. And that we will link to again in our show notes. But or, for those of you- or you can get it for free if you sign up you for can. our newsletter. You can do that too. Because, you know, we got to give people the freedom of choice and not everybody wants to spend money on listening to a podcast. That's true. But for those of you who do, we do offer video versions and show notes containing links to all of the products we mentioned. That's the perk for our patrons. And that's at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Wellevator. Until next time, we thank you for listening. Thanks for hearing our perspectives and our thoughts. And uh, we'll catch you for the next episode about regret in a couple days. Thanks for listening.